Hello, guys. Can everyone hear me? Oh, there we go. Well, thank you for coming. I think that's where we should start. Um, I know that this traffic dodging eco-mobility and collapsing bridges is not really the easiest thing in the world. But uh, so thank you very much for coming out. Um, <laughs> I'm going to be taking you tonight to or today through a couple of things that I've been through to get to the point where I can call myself a trader, some of the lessons and things that I've learned along the way. Um, it's a bit of an adventure. It's a bit of a lifestyle that you choose. Um, it's not always the easiest of lifestyles, but it is tremendously rewarding at times. So we're looking at the day in the life of a trader. An unexpected journey. I call it this. This is actually a J.R.R. Tolkien quote. I won't be ashamed in saying that. <laughs> um, I call it that because like in The Hobbit, which is this is the first chapter of, it was a bit of an unexpected journey and there were times at which I didn't think that I would quite survive it. Um, it was very ups and downs and there were moments of joy and moments of sadness. Um, it started sort of when I was 21 years old. I was working, well, I had been fired from a construction company for driving around the TLB. I don't know how many of you guys know what that is. It's basically a bulldozer with a back actor on it. So those are a lot of fun to drive and dig things and push things around or whatever. So I was doing that all day instead of junior project managing as I should have been. So I had a lot of time in my hands and I was sort of, you know, living at my dad's house at the time, not really knowing what to do. Uh, and a friend of mine had told me about this Forex stuff where you trade pips and pips are dollars and dollars are pips. And I had no idea what it was. So I downloaded a, um, like a platform. I think it was a MetaTrader platform at the time. And um, I started messing around with a demo account and just kind of like playing around with what uh, I could and could not do. Obviously, I blew maybe five or ten demo accounts in the process, lost all my fake money uh, <laughs> while I was at it. But in the process, I'd learned that this is what I wanted to do. The sort of It's like a bug that catches you. And I realized that this is the path that I need to walk in my life and that this, you know, this, is, this is my future. So I started taking some steps to learn what I need to learn in order to be able to do this. Um, obviously, I mean, I knew nothing, so it was a lot of Googling and a lot of going to events. I remember I came to the JSE week. Uh, they were still doing it back then, just talking to people, uh, networking, sort of just pestering and asking questions. And I managed to get invited to come sit on a trading floor once or twice. Um, and obviously, you go there all suited up in your best Sunday outfit, and you sit next to this broker guy, and you're looking at numbers, and you think, I can never do this. This is overwhelming. But uh, at the end of the day, uh, you just want to keep trying and you start building a network and you ask questions and whatever. Um, and I went through that whole process and then sort of, I don't know how, but hook and by crook, I say there, um, I got into a bank uh, through a friend of a friend of a friend of a family member. I managed to get into a bank. So there were, this was my first sort of stepping stone into the financial services realm um, where I joined the private banking sort of support team. You know, I was working in a call center kind of thing. And it was, uh, it was my first step into the financial services world where I thought that, you know, life is a, like a river and you've got a goal on the other side of the river. And the way that you get there is by stepping on little stones from time to time. You've got to jump off the one that you're on, which might be nice and big and comfortable onto one that's smaller and slippier. And then from there, you've got to move to the next one, to the next one, to the next one until you get to the other side. So this was my first stepping stone um, on my journey. They wouldn't have me at the trading desk after two years. <laughs> of uh, working there. While I was working there, I was earning, you know, relatively good money for, for someone who was, uh, you know, 22 at the time. So I started saving up and buying shares and kind of things. The first couple of trades I did were obviously disastrous. I think the first trade I ever did was Simmer and Jacks. I lost more than half my money on that trade. Um, and then I've still got 3,000 Tarbeck shares. It's been delisted. I don't even know. Um, I did buy a couple of good ones, though. I got Vodacom at 60 when they unbundled. Uh, I had some sassels, I had some SAPs and things. So it was, there were some good ones. In the course of the journey, I sold them all. I wish I hadn't, but I did. Um, so after a couple of years at the bank, well, it was two years exactly to the day, uh, I decided that it was time for to take the next step, to get off this comfortable little stepping stone I was on and to move to the next one. So I sort of took the attitude of work for knowledge, not for money, because the trading desk at uh, Investec wouldn't have me because I didn't know anything about trading. You know, I just had a trading account and I bought some shares every now and then. Uh, so I left the bank for a company where I was basically a sales guy selling technical analysis courses. You know, um, so every client I'd sell a course to, I'd be able to go to the go on the course with them, sit in the back and make notes. 
So I sold all the courses and I did all the things. I basically got all the education for free. I did this at two different firms uh, over a period of about a year and a half, maybe you know, about a year and a half I was doing that uh, until I sort of felt that I was ready. I had all the information, I had all the knowledge, I knew technical analysis like the back of my hand. I knew all the theory. I was ready to take the plunge into the next step of this. So I left there and I took all the money that I had, sold the shares that I had, borrowed some money from my dad and I went to a firm called Kratos Capital. Um, Kratos Capital at the time was still just a prop firm. So you would basically sit in the room and you would trade on a proprietary basis for yourself. Um, and there was a bit of a deal structure that they give you. And basically you can just trade all day, every day. And while I was there, you know, you this impression of trading is easy. I'm, I'm going to take my little paltry sum of money that I've got and I'm going to be a millionaire in a year because now I've made it. I'm a trader, you know. That was shattered very, very quickly. I fell into every pitfall you can think of. I mean, you overtrade, you trade too big, you don't predetermine your risk, you've got no idea what you're doing really. Uh, you trade emotionally, you fall victim to fear and greed. Everyone else in the room is long SAB because at the time, I remember it very clearly, a Brazilian website comes out with a rumor that uh, AB InBev is going to buy SAB. Sounds familiar, right? <laughs> so SAB runs up the page, everyone's cheering it on. Everyone's in the trade. I think, yes, everyone's making money. Max the account, boom, full gearing on this thing. And then it turns 20 bucks against me. <laughs> so these types of things, you know, it took me about five or so months to literally lose everything. You know, I lost all my money that I had uh, in that room. But in the process, I learned a couple of very, very important lessons. First one being, you can't predict the market. Okay, so you can do all the charts and do all the research and read everything that you can gather and you can think that, okay, I've got a fairly good idea of what's going on in the market. But the truth is the market will not do what you think it will do. Our job is to follow the market. The market gives you opportunities and your job is to take those opportunities. Oh, I'm going too far. Um, the market is bigger than what you are. So when you start thinking, okay, you know, there's a resistance level here. It looks like the sellers are drying up. I'm going to buy it up through the resistance level and see if I can push the market a little bit. It crushes you. The market is bigger than us. It is designed to take your money from you. So don't try and bully it in a direction uh, just because you think that you can. Also, never forget the bigger picture. So what I was doing is I was trading very speculatively and very sort of actively. Not allowed to hold shares overnight. So you've got to get in and out all the time. Um, and you've got to be in cash by the end of the day. So you get so focused on that tiny little time frame that you're looking at. Five minutes, one minute, ten minutes, whatever the case is. You trade the same stock every single day, but you never look at the daily graph, you never look at the weekly graph. You need to step back from time to time and look at the holistic big picture. You know? Next one is to not lose any discipline because losing discipline is very easy. You go on a winning streak and you think you walk on water. You go on a losing streak and you're trying to desperately get your money back and you start falling into these pitfalls of um, sort of over trading again and trading from fear. So emotions can and will take over. When you are in a situation where your heart is pumping while you're trading, you're doing it wrong. Okay, my heart's kind of pumping now, but <laughs> I'm not busy trading. So um, emotions do take over from time to time, and you need to learn to recognize when that happens and then sit on your hands. You know, if you can't read the market or you feel nervous or the market's making you uncomfortable, get out. You need to learn when to sit in your hands. And obviously humility was another thing because you think you're this hot shot and you've had a couple of good days and then one day comes and wipes all your progress and puts you further back than what you were before. So after Kratos, I was essentially poor and penniless. Um, I had no money left. No one would give me any more money uh, to trade. So I took an opportunity in Durban where someone, you know, through the network that I'd built from being shameless and asking people a whole bunch of questions, um, I took an opportunity in Durban where I basically worked for free. I sat in a trading room. It was a stockbroking firm. I sat there, for, I sat there, I earned no money, but I interacted with clients and I stayed in the market. So this was, again, just a learning curve for me. Now, for about five months of that, um, I had to come back to Johannesburg and then basically moved back into my dad's house. Spent a couple of months just going through RPEs, studying RPEs, writing exams, and applying for every job that you could find. Um, eventually, an opportunity came up in Cape Town at a hedge fund firm, and within a week, I'd moved down there. And um, yeah, 
I spent two years in Cape Town working in this firm, learning again. Um, I'd now sort of been trading for a little bit, so I was allowed to start managing some client accounts. And it was a hedge fund firm, so there were a couple of really small funds that I was allowed to manage. Um, so I started trading on behalf of clients and trading for them, managing accounts, that kind of thing. And a couple of very important things happened to me there. Firstly, I learned that I had the ability to accumulate. I had been through good times, I'd been through bad times, and I've seen that the bad times don't last, the good times don't last. But as long as you can accumulate over a year or two or three, and you can slowly grind your equity curve higher, you're on the right track. And I'd learned that I had the ability to do that. So this built a lot of confidence in my own abilities, you know, and I started becoming better. I started feeling that I was getting better every day. I was trying to learn every day. So eventually, an opportunity came up for me to come back to Johannesburg um, to work for the firm I'm working for now, which is in Kunzi. And here I am. It's now a couple of years later. So as Simon mentioned, a lot of people ask, what, uh, what does it take you know, to be a trader? There's a lot of questions. So there's two main questions that, uh, that people usually ask. The first one is, um, what should I study to be a trader? So what's important to remember is that there is nothing that a university or a textbook or a person can teach you that's going to help you make money in the stock market. You can learn accounting, you can do business science, whatever it is that you want to do. Nothing in any of those textbooks is going to teach you how to, how to trade. You have to do it with real money, lose, learn, lose, learn. So um, if you want to do it for clients, though, uh, or be a stockbroker or whatever the case is, you, there's a couple of regulatory exams that you have to do. These are called registered person exams. Um, you, you do them through the South African Institute of Financial Markets, saifm.co.za, for those who want to go check it out. They've got a little thing of which exams you need to do to be what kind of broker. So there's the equity market and commodities and forex and bonds and that kind of stuff. It really does help doing those, even if you're not going to do it for clients, because it gives you a very good understanding of the practical, how the market works. I mean, like there's a trader's exam, for example, that teaches you how the central order book works and how the JSC matches trades and settles them and that kind of thing. So that's kind of helpful. Um, if you do want to study something, economics is quite helpful because the market, everything is interrelated and economics gives you a sort of a good overview of how things affect one another and so on. Uh, currently, I'm busy studying CMT, which is a fancy way of saying that I'm studying how to draw lines and do technical analysis, not because I think it's going to give me a boost in my career or anything like that, but because I think that there's a lot of knowledge in there that I can put in my little toolkit that I'm currently using and help me read the market better. The next question is, how do I get into a firm? So I've asked this to a lot of people, and every time they told me you need passion, I've heard this a million times. I didn't really understand what that means until now when I look back and I think, okay, well, you know what? I lived on people's couches. I didn't earn any money for three years. I sacrificed everything. That's what they mean by passion. It needs to consume you. This, this, was, this became my only option. So you need to have passion. You need to go to a firm with a trade record of real money trades. You can't go with a demo account and expect them to hand over client accounts to you. You've got to do it with real money. It's different with real money. So if you don't believe in yourself and you're not willing to go through that process of saving up Losing your money, saving up, losing your money. No one else is going to give you a chance. Oh, okay, I'm going to breathe. <laughs> and money can't be a motivator. So if you walk into a firm and you say, well, I want to be a stockbroker because I want to make a lot of money, that's not the right attitude. You, you've got to be motivated by trading, getting the trading right. If you trade well, the money will come. So now that I'm here, there's a couple of things that, um, that I suppose I should share with you. First thing is sort of the daily routine. A lot of people think that trading is, well, the internet marketers will have you believe that some lady with brilliant teeth took $50 and now she's making $1,000 a day. And it's, you know, just it's this easy thing. And it can be eventually, but it takes some time. So there's a bit of a daily routine that one goes through or that I go through uh, on a daily basis. So it starts with waking up. You've got to get out of bed. <laughs> and usually before you're out of bed, You've opened Bloomberg and you've looked, where's the S&P, uh, where's the Dow, what's happening in Asia, what's happening in Australia, where's the RAND, where's gold, oil, copper, those kind of things, you know. So you check the markets before you, before you do anything. And then you have breakfast because you've got to eat, right? Um, and it's important to eat something that loads you. I put a little recipe there for those who want to try a smoothie. I got it off the internet. 
so you don't have to uh, <laughs> you don't have to worry about thing. But uh, it is quite tasty. I won't lie. Um, so you have that because it's low GI kind of stuff, and it keeps you focused for the whole day, and you've got fuel for fuel brain to run because you're thinking the whole day. Um, you get dressed and shower because society has standards, and we have to be clean all the time and brush our teeth and stuff. It's weird. But um, and then you know, off to the office I go, uh, and usually when I'm in traffic, which is terribly boring, I start phoning other people, other traders, start talking to them because now I've checked the markets, I've seen a couple of news headlines and stuff, but they've seen different things. So you share information with people, then you chat, and you sort of just gather information you share it amongst each other, other traders. Um, you get to the office, put your PC on, it feels like it takes 400 years to boot. So in the process, you make some coffee, you go, oh, I stand outside on the balcony, have a smoke. It's like the quiet before the storm, you know? Then there's a pre-market open period. This is quite a busy period, actually. Um, so now you can have a more detailed look at what happened overnight. You can now use your charting software because your PC eventually turned on. Um, and you can go through the charts, look at the S&P, look at these things. Was there intraday reversals? Was there big news that moved the market? Um, where the support and resistance levels, that kind of stuff. Are there big stories that you missed? Did the FOMC say something? Did uh, someone bomb someone, you know, whatever the case is? Then after that, you've got to have a look at what's coming up for the day. So you look at economic calendars. So I've put two links there. Forexfactory.com is quite a handy one. And tradingeconomics.com is a handy one for local um, <clears throat> local news and so on. So this gives you like a at 2:30, you know, non-farm payrolls is coming out. At 3:30, this is coming out. So you've got an idea of what's happening throughout the course of the day. After that, you go through your Sens feed. Sens is a stock exchange news service. So it's, uh, locally listed companies, well, all listed companies really, are required to report to shareholders on a, you know, at, simultaneously. You can't have one some investors getting information before others. So the Stock Exchange News Service is where they report first and from there the media picks it up and you get the stories in the newspaper and whatever. So you go through Sens and you look basically for a couple of things. One is stocks in play. So this is a concept um, basically from a book called uh, The Playbook by Mike Bellafiori or Bellafiori, I don't know how to say it. Um, SMBU, uh, it's quite a cool website, you can check it out. Um, so what a stock in play is, is something that meets your criteria of liquidity and size and whatever. Um, obviously, you can't trade a stock that only trades 100,000 shares a day because it's, you know, there's not a lot of trading happening and it's too like, illiquid and you can't get out and you can't get in and it's chaotic. So it's got to meet your, your um, criteria. And if there's fresh news on it, that's the, that's the key. So let's say, for example, company XYZ has been growing their earnings by 20% a, a year. And suddenly they come out with a trading statement that says, we've earned 20% less money this month or this year. Or we've doubled. We've, instead of doing 20% growth, we've done 100% growth. So now there's a real reason that this stock's going to move. So now that stock's in play. Now you know, okay, when the market opens, I can look at this little thing. Also, you're looking for developments of companies that you follow, the stuff that's on your watch list. So you're looking for um, you know, results or an ongoing court case and an outcome or the SAB thing. Every day they put something out. So you sort of just keep abreast with what's happening in the world. After that, I check Twitter. It's very handy. Um, I use something called TweetDeck, so you can see a whole bunch of different things at the same time. Uh, and you're looking basically for sentiment. How sarcastic are people? How bullish are they? How bearish are they? Do they, um, you know, what are their comments around what's happening? So I've put a couple of Twitter handles there of people that I think are, are really good. Storm Trading is there. I think they're fantastic. They're one of the local sort of prop firms, uh, very much like Kratos Capital. Uh, the Jedi Economist, Cal Confidence, they're both anonymous. Um, Hammering Stuff is also, she trades like index futures and that kind of stuff. She's pretty good. And then Ransquark. Ransquark is cool. It's also a service that you can subscribe to. It's like £25 a month or something to like that. It's basically a bunch of guys that sit in a room with a Bloomberg terminal and a Reuters terminal and all different things. And they just kind of like talk rubbish. Everything that they see, they kind of, you know, squawk about it. So they're a very good source of information. Um, then again, before the market opens again, you sort of you go through your charts. So now you're looking at your dailies, your weeklies, you're looking at uh, the trades that you're in, you're looking for setups that you've been tracking, whether or not they've triggered, and you're looking, you know, maybe there's an opportunity in one of the stocks in play kind of thing. And you just sort of track your progress. After that, uh, half past eight, futures market opens. So now the Aussie starts trading. Here, sometimes there's a bit of a chance because the market maker in the all me, which is the mini contract, only really wakes up about 20 minutes into the session. So 
sometimes there's a few bids and offers that are not quite the same as where the real market is trading. And I know it's many contracts, but it's free money, you know. So there's sometimes a little bit of arbitrage opportunity there. After that, you get, I get on the phone, start phoning clients, obviously. I've got a whole bunch of clients. Um, so you've got to sort of build a game plan with them. By now, you've got a good idea of what your game plan is for the day. And you get an idea from them. Where are they? What are they thinking? Have they seen anything you haven't? Have you seen anything they haven't? And you form, formulate a game plan for the day. Uh, auction call period opens when the future is open, so you can start placing orders. Um, I like to put a couple of Hail Mary orders in. I call them that because some are really low, some are really high. You never know. Something goes wrong, it opens really low, and you get a, you know, like a free trade. First inning. So the equity market opens at 9. So now there's going to be opportunities where things either come out too high or too low. Um, Sassel, for example, has an ADR, which is an American depository receipt. It closes at a certain level in the United States. Uh, the RAND exchange is at a certain level, which gives it a certain RAND value here. There's no major news on it. It opens 10 rand lower. Bye. <laughs> you know. Um, you also sort of sectoral things. So you look at something like the gold miners, for example. All of them are up except Sibanya. Is there news on Sibanya? Did you see anything on Sens? Did you see anything in the morning? No, there's not. Okay, something's gone wrong here. Someone's messed up. There's a free opportunity for you. Um, and during this period, I mean, this first sort of session, it goes to about 11 o'clock. You're looking at charts. You're looking for setups. You're looking for triggers stuff that you've been watching, and there's maybe been a trigger for you to get in or get out of a trade. Um, and you're sort of going through continuous trading, and you know, you look at, I look at a lot of the bid and offer screen. So look at the market depth, and just look at the interaction between buyers and sellers. Um, th during this period, like sort of in the first couple of minutes when the market opens, go through the charts after that, bang, continuous trading, where you sort of plug into the bid and offer. I'll go through that in a second. At about 11 o'clock-ish, you start feeling tired, you need coffee, and starting to get hungry again. So, okay, reading the price action. This is basically a bid and offer screen. Now, most guys will have on your platforms at home just the first five lines. You see they're colored here. Um, this is a sort of a level two platform, so you've got the entire market depth. There's more that keeps going down. All the bids and all the offers in the market is there. What you're looking for here is basically algos. <coughs> I'm sure everybody knows what an algo is. It's an algorithmic equation, I suppose, that's been written. Uh, runs on a server somewhere in the basement of the JSC, and it's designed to steal your money. So <laughs> you're looking for for algo. So you can see there's a whole string of 200s here, um, and a couple of 500s. Here you've got some 480s and 580s. Uh, that's basically an algo. I mean, that's 10 cents a part, bunch of 200s. So you're looking for those kind of algos, and they can sometimes be very aggressive. Like if you look at what's happening on Remgro, I don't know where it closed because I was here, but for most part of the day, I traded very low volume but it traded up, and that's just because this algo keeps pushing and pushing and pushing it with tiny volume, little bids of 140 shares at a time. This morning, also on Sassel, there was a string of 60s, one cent apart, on the bid side, then it flashes to the offer side. It flashes to the bid side, flashes to the offer side. So you know that there's an interaction here. Also, on Coronation, for example, that 18,500 and that 17,700, usually they're pretty close to each other, but I bet you that's the same guy sitting on the bid and offer. Never really trades, but when he comes close to the offer, he pushes volume and he scares the buyers away and the price collapses. You know, And then he does the same in the opposite direction. So you're looking out for those kind of things. You're looking for big buyers and sellers. So that would also be that 17, 18,000. Uh, you're looking at that level there. That'd probably be a, turn out to be a support level, 5,000 and so on. Um, and you can see there's a big offer there. So And the price is down 2.5% or 2.3%. So you can see the sellers are there and the big volume is on the sell side. Um, you're also looking for icebergs. So now put yourself in the mindset of, uh, of a unit trust manager. You've got a million coronation shares that you've got to sell. You can't put a million, offers, a million shares in the offer. You'll chase every buyer away. So what they do is they use an iceberg order, which is basically to say, okay, I'll put a million shares in the market at this price, but only show a 1,000 at a time. So people will then buy a 1,000 and then... It'll reload with another thousand. Da -da -da -boom, da -da -da -boom. That's actually an opportunity. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it doesn't work. But most times, most times there's a very good trade that can come from something like that. I'll show you that a bit later. So anyway, then after about two or so hours of that, you need a bit of a woosa. So you've got to have some lunch. You've got to go stand on the balcony a bit, let your mind go. Um, it helps to sort of just stare out the window for a bit because then. 
uh, your mind sort of rethinks the trades that you're managing and you see it from a bit of a different angle, uh, which is quite nice. You can cycle through your charts again, looking at the daily time frames, the hourly time frames, the weekly time frames, uh, and all, literally all the charts in your watch list. You've got to go through all of them. Um, and then, you know, you start chatting to other traders, you talk, start talking to them a bit, uh, exchange weird pictures and dirty jokes and that kind of stuff. And also find out what trades they're in. Are they in the same trades you're in? Or you, you know, have they seen something you haven't? Have you seen something they haven't? Share information. That's quite important. Um, and then scour sends. Because while you were looking at the bid and offer screen, you may have missed something. So you go back through sends and you make sure there's anything on stuff that I'm watching that's important or something that a weird company I've never heard of brought out that could move the stock tremendously. So second innings. After your little woosa, uh, you start sort of getting back into the zone and start focusing once again, and it's back to continuous trading. So now, because you looked at the economic calendar a little earlier in the morning, you know that at 2.30 there's US data. It's usually at 2.30 because well, the only time it's not is when it's at 3.30 because it's daylight savings time. So if there is US data, it comes out an hour before the market opens. So US data is pretty much the important one, um, but there is also European stuff that comes out earlier. But usually, you know, you got to keep an eye out for stuff like non-farm payrolls and unemployment claims. So there's a difference between the daily numbers and the monthly numbers. Um, so the monthly numbers are obviously a lot more important, but the weekly numbers also uh, have the ability to move the market because we're in a situation now at present where we're all watching U.S. data to see whether or not, uh, you know, interest rates are going to go up or the whole world's going to end or whatever. So um, you got to sort of stay sharp around this time because it has the ability to, to move the market. At half past three, the U.S. market opens. So a couple of things happen here. Firstly, volume picks up because uh, U.S. participants now start trading as well. Also, with things that are due listed or have an ADR in America, um, they might start buying or selling it on that side. And we've got to keep the price in RAND terms equal to what it is there. So you can see our shares starting to move. You can see the Dow or the, the S&P 500 is the one that I follow. Start pushing the Aussie kind of thing. Um, so that can push the indexes and so on. So whatever direction they tend to take, we tend to follow, except for today, which is weird. Everything was up, we were not. But um, also, you know, you got to watch out for reversals because sometimes it opens and then boom. So, and also our market could like trend up the whole day, the US market opens and we fall off a cliff. So you got to watch out for those kind of things and be awake for that. Final stretch of the day. Um, it's been long. You've been focusing the whole day. You're running out of, time, uh, out of energy. So you got to drink some coffee, you know, have a, another smoke if you're a smoker. Um, get yourself ready for the last half an hour of the day. It's important to remember that the highest volume is trading in the first and last half an hour of each day. So this is your last chance. If you've got intraday trades that you put on in the morning or in the afternoon, this is your last chance to get out before auction because auction might not work in your favor. Sometimes you trade it up, auction, close it down. So if you don't want to get out in the auction, this is your last chance. Another good trade to do is take maybe 10 minutes before the auction starts, look at where the volume weighted average price is on a stock, um, Odds are it's going to close at that price uh, in the auction. If it's a far away, uh, you know, either lower or higher, you can either go long or short and then just throw it out in the auction. That's quite a cool trade. Uh, closing auction, again, place orders, put a couple of Hail Marys in. You never know something. Uh, someone might do a finger fault and push the price up really high into the close and you can get short for the overnight session. Uh, oh, there we go. So after the, after the whole day is now over, um, you need to log your trades. Okay, and put everything to a spreadsheet. Uh, if you haven't done it already, you've got to sit there and log them all, go through your trade record. Log them all, share, price, time, reason, volume. Those are the things that you've got to have in there. Why did you trade it? Um, this helps you to go through the trades and then sort of evaluate where did you go right, where did you go wrong, where can you do better. Uh, if you have certain setups that you're trading, you can see which setups are doing really well, which setups are not doing really well. So the ones that you do well, you know you can trade a bit bigger. The ones that aren't doing well, you should maybe think of scrapping. Um, I normally do some radio stuff, which is weird, but uh, it forces me to recap all the big news stories for the day. So this is a good idea, actually. It helps quite a bit. So you got to sit and do some reading and that kind of thing. Uh, and then continue going through your trades until you're done uh, so that you make sure that you really sort of got to analyze them. I took this trade. Why did I take it? Because this and this and this. Okay, was this the right choice? Da -da -da -da, that kind of sort of self-evaluation thing. Um, oh, halfway. And then during this process, you keep an eye on the U.S. market just to see what's happening. Are they trending higher? Are they, you know, did they open strong and come down or whatever the case is? Um, so I got some example of one-minute charts here, uh, which is nice because here 
this is what I use to sort of go through my trade. So I can see here, okay, I traded there or I traded there and I went long and then I stopped out there and I was silly because then I could have gotten out there or whatever the case is. Um, this is coronation from a little while ago and this is Lonman on the day it went mad, up 15%, down 20%, it's just crazy. Um, you can see clearly someone hit the panic button here and <laughs> down it comes, you know. Uh, here you can see a nice like resistance level. So these are handy to use during the day. So you can see that opened high, seller rocked up, Try to buy it through, try to buy it through, capitulated a bit, came back, seller was there, seller was there, seller was there, closed it lower. So when you see this type of thing happening and you saw there was a level here, you could maybe consider selling here next time it comes up during the course of the day. Um, so it's helpful to find those kinds of things and it's easy to see when you're evaluating your trades where you got in, where you got out and you know, you look at the chart with a candle pattern or whatever the case is and you think you see something but this is really, at the end of the day, you go through it and you say, okay, on a one minute chart, I traded there, that was a stupid thing to do. Or oh, I traded there and that was the best time I could have done it. So after that, you've got to go home. Um, you've got to make or eat dinner. It sounds like I eat a lot. I'm a skinny guy. I don't know. Um, so you've got to make or eat dinner. You've got to do something to unwind. So cooking is cool. Uh, or playing TV games or reading books or whatever it is that you do. But you've got to find something to take your mind off of the stock market because you've been doing this the whole day and you do this every day and it consumes you which is very cool, but it is very exhausting. So you need to find something else to focus on. Take your attention away, speak to people that you like, or uh, you know, your friends do something other than focus on the stock market. Uh, eventually you've got a shower because again, society has uh, standards that we have to stick by. Um, and then it's time to go to bed pretty much. So before you go to bed, invariably you check the market again. Oh, where's the S&P? What's happening there? So that you understand uh, just a bit more and you're a bit more ready for when you wake up to check your phone again. Um, and you go to bed. So uh, I'm going to take you through some of my some of my favorite setups that I use to trade. Um, a lot of them don't come along very often. The first one, uh, I actually put this chart on Twitter, although I didn't trade it. Um, it's just a simple line break. Just keep it simple. Forget moving averages, forget all the fancy indicators and whatever. Just look at the price. And there's a nice little trend, and it broke, and it gave a buy signal. Now, I didn't take this trade. I don't know why. I should have. Um, in my defense, ooh, sorry, in my defense, I was long the stock from 8 rand 50 and was losing a lot of money. So when I saw that, I was very relieved that uh, it was coming up. And I actually managed to throw it out 9 rand, <laughs> which is nice. But, um, yeah, you know, probably could have made more. I don't know, whatever. Um, so that's just a very simple setup. It's very easy. Uh, it's very pure. A lot of people try to overcomplicate things by putting on 50,000 million indicators. It doesn't necessarily work. The simplest things work the best. Uh, the next one is head and shoulders pattern. This is a trade that I actually took. Um, so you can see there's actually a simple line break that was your entry signal while this thing was busy brewing. And then eventually it matured and it broke the neckline. It came all the way down to that. Now this doesn't very happen very often. These don't come around. Ironically, on the one-hour charts, there's a whole bunch. There's one on Sassel, there's one on Peregrine, not Peregrine, sorry, PSG. Uh, there's one on Anglos at the moment. Uh, I think they're all closed down. Um, so they're busy playing out. Disclaimer, I am Sorge Sassel. Um, so these are very nice. And what's important to remember is that the volume needs to play along. So you can't really see the volume here because there was big corporate action happening, so it's not quite the same. But what's basically happening is volume needs to reduce all the way through that head and shoulders. If it's inverse, it's got to increase. Uh, if it's normal one, like a topping pattern, like this, volume's got to sort of come down into the last shoulder and then before it breaks out. The last one is, I was talking about icebergs and how they provide you with, um, with opportunities. So you can see here, there's a five minute chart, how flat it gets. 292, all you can eat. There's an iceberg, it's showing a thousand at a time, you can buy 10,000, it'll reload every time. Boom, 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 boom. And eventually, at some point, it goes bid at 292.01, and everything stops. No one sells to the guy bid at 292.01. And you buy whatever's on the offer, you just buy it because bang, up she goes. Okay, so this happens very, very seldomly, but this is probably my favorite setup. Um, it's happened on Coronation about a year ago was the last time it happened there. It happened here, well, this was a couple of days ago, um, or well, last week. So it's a very nice setup to use, um, and it's very seldom that it comes by, but I know this is the one setup that's like A+. Plus. Um, again, a concept from Mike Bellafori's book. Um, I sound like I'm advertising books. <laughs> uh, 
Um, but basically, this is a setup that I know when it comes around, and you can see it, whoop, you can see how the little candles get shorter and shorter and shorter as that pressure builds. And you know, okay, this is something I can trade bigger than what I usually do. So a bit of a reality check um, for a lot of guys because what happens is we get fooled by this whole thing of, you know, trading. And it's got like a stigma, right? You know, it's this amazing thing that you just do for a couple hours a day and you just become a millionaire. Um, and yes, that can happen, but it takes years to get there. So some things that you sort of need to look out for. Staying focused is difficult, okay? So sitting at your desk the whole day, not texting people and not planning parties and brides on the weekends and that kind of thing is difficult. You've got to stay focused. You remember, it's not social. Yes, every now and then you talk to other traders, but you're talking to other traders. You're not talking to your friends. You're not answering your phone when your best friend calls you and says, hey, dude, I'm so over. I don't care, okay? <laughs> You've got to take signals without hesitation. If you're not focused, you're not going to be able to do this. <laughs> See, nice dude. Um, if you're not focused, you're not going to be able to take that signal because you're not going to be present. You're not going to notice when the iceberg breaks because you're going to be looking at your cell phone. So take signals without hesitation. If you get a buy signal, take it. Sometimes the market looks horrid and it gives you a buy signal. Now what do you do? You know, Or it gives you a sell signal and everything's going up. You've Take your, you made that rule, you follow it, you know. Um, manage your risk. So know what you can lose. A lot of people use a 2% rule. Um, it works well. But what they do then is they forget about exposure. So you've got 100,000 Rand in your account. You can buy a million Rand's worth of stock. It's wonderful, but you shouldn't. Because we forget that if you've got 10 positions open, they all have a 2% stop loss, and the market moves maybe 3% down, you get stopped out 10 times on 2%. That's 20% capital gone. So don't forget about exposure, okay? Because now, just because you can trade a million rands worth of shares doesn't mean it's a good idea, <laughs> okay? You've got to manage that exposure and make sure that you keep it low. So have rules. If the market comes down 5 or 10%, I will gear two or three times. Um, but if the market is within the five, f highest 5% uh, or within 5% from its all-time high, I will only gear once. So it means you make less money, but it means you lose less money. And the idea here is to be in the game for a long time, sustainability, surviving the storm, is how you make money. Um, don't juggle too many balls. So I can't really handle more than six, sometimes eight, but mostly six trades at a time because then you sort of feel that, you know, you're just too stretched. You've got, you're focusing on too many different things. You can't have too many trades open at the same time. You need to be able to give them individual attention and process them and think about them. And if you have 20 trades open, I mean, half the time you don't even know what price you got in on some things, which is why it's also important to keep a journal and write that stuff down at the end of every day. You need to have downtime. You need to be able to relax. This is something that I relearn every couple of months. I haven't actually had a week away from the markets and you burn out and you stress and you feel like you're losing your mind because you literally don't ever relax. You need to learn when to say, okay, you know what? It's time I take a week off. After a winning streak, after a losing streak, you've got to just step away from it and have some downtime. Right, the scary stuff. So this is what the, adver the, the, the TV ads on Bloomberg and the internet, the lady with the wonderful teeth, don't tell you. This is probably the most difficult thing you're ever going to do in your life. It will put you through emotional and stress and pressure unlike anything that you've ever tried. Okay, There is not a single trader that I know that has made it to the point where they're trading either professionally for other people or full-time that has not gone through utter hell to get there. It is not an easy thing. You've got to be willing to go through that process. Often we're very hard on ourselves, so we forget that we make mistakes. We forget that it's okay to be wrong and that kind of thing. So we think, ah, oh, I can't do this, I can't do this, I can't do this, and then you end up not being able to do it. It can make you feel helpless. You go through a couple of trades, you lose one, lose two, lose three, now you're starting to feel like, yes, the market's out to get me. You know? At that point, you sort of... You stop, you stop listening to your rules. You start trying to revenge trade. You start falling into those pitfalls that you trade too big. You don't plan your trades. You're just kind of trying to make your money back because you're trying to trade from a fear-based space. So that feeling of helplessness is very dangerous. Then you need to sit on your hands. You need to do nothing. You need to understand also that the risk is not always known. So you can predetermine your risk. That's fine. And then your short SAB and AB InBev makes a bid for it. 
you know, you get blown out of the water because you've traded too big and you thought, okay, well, it's a 2% stop. The stop's really tight. I can trade it. You know, it works out. I must gear my account three times because you didn't think about the gearing. You just, that spits out the equation, spits out a number of shares you need to be short. Now you geared three times and the stock rallies 20% up in a day and maybe your stop loss didn't trigger or your stop loss put you in and the market just kept going and you've got a limit order on the, on the bid and the market's running away with you. So the risk is not always known. So it's important to manage your, um, your exposure. And sometimes you can go through a bit of a whirlwind of bad trades. So you make one bad trade, you feel a little, uh, make another one. And before you know it, you're back in that, not following your rules, falling to the pitfalls. And it's just this spiral that spins out of control, at which point you need to learn, sit on my hands, go on holiday, do something. Just don't trade for a few days so you can come back with a fresh mind. So how to manage all of that? I suppose I've done a lot of this already. But you need to remember, this too shall pass. So every state that we're in, be it a positive state or a negative state, is temporary. Everything is temporary. Life is temporary. We're all at risk of sounding very morbid. I'm not going to go there. Um, but uh, everything is temporary. So if you go through like a bad patch, it will pass. You will eventually come through it. You just need to keep going. So, I mean, 90% or well, most traders uh, lose all their money and fail. This is a stat that I'm sure all of you have read somewhere. That's because they all give up. If you just keep trying, the universe has no choice but to give you what you want. You know, the 10% of the guys that do it, Lose all their money, save up some more. Lose all their money, save up some more. I can't tell you I've blown a bunch of accounts. You know, so you got to keep trying, and you got to have positive soft talk. You got to believe in yourself. For a long time, I woke up every morning saying, "I'm going to be the best stockbroker in this country," and then the goal changed a little bit to, "I'm going to be the best trader in this country," and then the goal changed a little bit again, and I'm going, "Well, okay, I'm going to be the best, the best trader that I can be." You know, I'm only I'm not competing against anyone else. I'm competing against myself. Market, yes, you compete against other people that are professional and have been doing this for a very long time and have much better resources than what you have. But you're ultimately competing against yourself because what people don't realize is that this is not about being smart or about, you know, <laughs> being really good at maths or whatever the case. It's about being able to control your emotion. If you can do that and understand that, then you can do this. So, and that is helped by speaking positively about yourself and to yourself. Okay, if you don't believe in yourself, it's not going to work. A system can save your sanity. So having rules can, um, can keep you sort of sane. Sometimes it drives you crazy because you get a buy signal and nothing looks right. But you take that buy signal and the trade works out. And that relief that you get, like, okay, it works. You know, my system works. That can keep you very sane. That can help you a lot uh, in the long run. Taking time off also is important. Um, I've mentioned this before, you need downtime. You need to be able to get away. Uh, if you are very stressed, you do need to just, I don't know, Simon goes surfing. It sounds like, I wish I could surf. I can, I don't know, stand and fall. That's what I can do. But you need to be able to get away from it from time to time. You remember that you're a person. You're a human. You make mistakes. It's okay. You need to remember that it's okay to be wrong. Our entire lives we're taught in school, in university, and everywhere. If you put your hand up and you answer the wrong question, everyone laughs at you. In the stock market, the best guys that I know, the best traders that I know, are probably wrong most of the time. But when they're right, they know that too. So they take a trade, get stopped out. Take a trade, get stopped out. Take a trade, and that doesn't feel right. And then eventually, they get one right, and those 10, 20 bad trades that they made, they make back in one trade. So patience, I suppose, is very important as well. Um, and being wrong is okay. There's nothing, And being able to admit when you're wrong, because that's what we do. We don't admit when we're wrong, because we're taught... Drive on the side of the road, work really hard, and you're going to make a lot of money. In the stock market, you don't have to work really hard to make a lot of money. You just need to be awake and be alert and be there. So you've got to be able to admit, I'm on the wrong side of this trade, get out. And that's where most people go wrong because they think that I did all the analysis. I read the charts. I read the news. This thing must go down. But the market's proving you wrong. The sooner you're willing to admit that, the sooner you can cut the damage, maybe swing the trade and make some money. Then this is a quote, a paraphrased quote, from, uh, well, who's now the late, um, well, I've lost his name completely. <laughs> anyway, he, read, he wrote um, Trading in the Zone, Mark Douglas. Okay, he's passed away recently, which is quite sad. He was, I think, one of the greats. He wrote a lot of books on psychology uh, and trading psychology and so on. And he says, 
that whatever outcome we receive, essentially, from any action we've taken or decision that we've made, is nothing more than the perfect reflection of where we are in our development and what we need to do in order to improve. And that's it. If you can keep that, ad that attitude in your head and think like, okay, that didn't work. What can I do? How can I improve on it? You need to remember that we're fallible. We make mistakes, you know? Uh, so why do it if it's so difficult and dreadful and all these difficult things? Um, because it's in your bones. You've got no choice. It becomes you. It defines you. It, it's like an infection that just grows inside of you. It takes over your entire life. And it really just it becomes a part of you. It is this unsolvable puzzle that never, that always changes, you know? Um, and there's a certain satisfaction that you get from doing the perfect trade. And you know what? That perfect trade might not be a winner. You know, but knowing that I got in here, I got out there, my rule said buy, my rule said sell. And following that is, you know, always think I should have done it bigger. But following those rules is basically what keeps you, what keeps you sane. And it's immensely satisfying to know that I pulled off three or four perfect trades in a row where I just followed my rules, tick for tick, tick for tick. Every time my rule said do something, I did it without hesitation at the right time. And it's worked out. This time is different, I say. <laughs> what that basically what I mean by that is that um, every single day is unique. Every single moment is unique. You know, you think that because every time the US market opens, the ADRs of Sassel are being bought and it pushes the Sassel price up. So every afternoon you can come in half past three, buy some Sassels, throw it out on the auction. That works for a while and then it changes. And then you've got to spot a new pattern. You know, so every day is different. Every chart is different. Every the, nothing is ever the same. It's this unsolvable puzzle, like I said, where you've constantly got to try and figure it out. And also, if you can master the art of this thing, and I mean, I'll admit I'm not there yet, but if you can really master trading, that trade for two hours a day, make ten thousand dollars a day in two hours, that can be the truth. It, I know people who do that. You know. Literally just speak to their broker for a couple of hours a day and make an absolute fortune because they've been doing it for long enough and they've been doing it, you know, they've been really pouring their heart and soul into this thing and giving it everything that they've got. So it's also the last frontier. So we live in an era where it's too soon to explore the galaxy and go and find some rare mineral on a different planet somewhere that everybody suddenly needs and makes you a billionaire in a year. But we're too late to explore the earth and do the same. So how can you go from relatively no money or very little money to an absolute fortune? There's only one place left, and that's the stock market. So if you can master this, you can do that. You can take your 50 grand or your 10 grand, and you can build it into 10 million because it happens. You hear those stories, and those stories are true. Sadly, yes, a lot of guys don't make it, but that's because they give up. So then... And sort of the last sort of final thought uh, to this whole thing is that again it's an adaptation of Mike Bilafori, um, where he says that this is the only thing in the world where if you look at your own character, your own character flaws, and your own things with your shortcomings, you're impatient, you you know make irrational decisions, and you work on those things in your own character, you can be rewarded financially. If you learn to be more patient with people, you can learn to be more patient with traits. If you learn to not react emotionally, you will be less susceptible to making silly trading mistakes. So it's the only thing in the world where if you work on yourself, you can be rewarded financially for it. And that is my story. So thank you very much. Thanks, Petri. Uh, we've got some minutes if there are some questions. I uh, just wanted to find out these robotic tradings. How does it affect you on a daily basis? It drives you mad. <laughs> um, so sometimes, you know, sometimes you, you, you can sort of figure them out a little bit. Um, if you sit and watch them long enough and you can, you can mess with them or you can see. You never want to trade against the algo. There was when I was sitting at trade class, um, every time I traded or got matched in a trade on uh, Richmond, I was on the wrong side because the algo had my number. Everything I did, and you'll see it's 10,000, 15,000, 10,000, three bids, three offers, both sides, always. And when that thing matches you, you're on the wrong side. And it's like, so I mean, remember also, 
um, you can think creatively. They can't. So you've got a bit of an upper hand because you're human, but they think a lot faster than you do. You know, they, you can see the thing is just changing all the time. I mean, there's no way that's a person. So sometimes it can be tremendously frustrating. I mean, if you look at Remgro, for example, it just keeps pushing the price up, pushing the price up, pushing the price up, but on like zero volume. So it can be very frustrating if you look at the thing and you see the setup is to go short and it's not going short. It's just the algo is keeping it up. But they don't last forever. They run out of ammo eventually. I got two questions. Um, first one is, you mentioned a lot about your daily sort of um, routine and after hours, social media and cell phones came into it. How do you think that changed, obviously, before that was around? And secondly, you're not worried with the amount of food you eat that you're still so skinny or not. <laughs> I think I have worms. Um, no, I don't know. I've been, I've been no, whatever, I'm not going to answer that question. It's the nervous so, energy. <laughs> so, I don't know. I think that, uh, I mean, I wasn't trading when they were still trading in the pits and stuff. Um, yeah, so I'll answer that because I'm the old man in the room and I remember days when when we were on uh, user groups it was about as exciting as it got. So, so social media has had two huge impacts. One is speed of information moving. Um, I remember particularly it was, I think it was the De Beers deal. Um, I found out about it about four hours after it was announced. I, I happened to make money from it, but I saw it move. I didn't, there was no news flow. So the one is the absolute speed that information is disseminated globally to every last corner of it. And the second is access to people. You know, you, you can, I, I can get onto Twitter and ask Alan Greenspan a question. He will ignore me, probably, but I can do that. So it's that sudden access, whereas I was back in the 90s sitting in, in Valley of a Thousand Hills, um, and it was me and a couple of guys in a user group, and there were six of us. Suddenly, social media means there are 300 million of us. And in truth, 299 million are not worth knowing, but um, there's at least a million or so that are worth knowing. So I think it's, it's uh, the, the book, um, Flat World, Flat Earth, you know, it's just flattened everything. It's removed time and geography from the process, and it's leveled that playing field, whereas we previously would have been in a disadvantage because we weren't in the heat of the trading room. Now we've got the better access. You. Just two questions. First one, why did you prefer to go with a bear instead of a bull? Are you like shorting most of your stocks during the day? <laughs> Second question, uh, when you started trading, did you start as an investor and then moved slowly to trading or are you trading two separate accounts, one as investing and one as trading? Because I've been trading for two years, but I'm more struggling with the trading part than I'm making more money as an investor than I am as trading. The fees are killing me. Okay. Um, sounds like you need a cheaper broker. <laughs> um, right, so the bear is because I'm naturally predisposed to be bearish. I, you know, I've been sitting through this market going, it's going to fall, it's going to fall, it's going to fall, and I've been wrong most of the time. But yeah, I think it's just sort of a natural predisposition that I have. Some people are bulls, some people are bears. Um, you were born that way, I think. Um, uh, when I started trading, I started sort of as an investor, I suppose. Um, I mean, my first trade on Simmer and Jacks had a target and a stop loss, um, which I didn't follow. You know. um, partly because it was bloody liquid, you know, you couldn't get out either. And I was trading on an end of day basis, and the thing, you know, anyway. Um, so, yeah, I suppose it is easier to make money in the long term because you just kind of buy it and hold it. Um, but on the shorter term stuff, you can make considerably more if you get it right. Um, but yeah, I think I did sort of start as an investor and at the moment I'm turning into a bit of an investor more and more than what I am a trader because I'm starting to see that, you know, I bought Capitec 330 Rand, came off a bit, I got some more 322 or 324 or something like that and I sold it all at 360 and I thought I was a rock star. <laughs> yeah. you, you never sell Capitec, <laughs> ever, <laughs> just saying. Folks, I'm going to leave it there. Um, I, I know you promise we've got questions, but we're hitting time. I want to let you go back into the traffic. There's still some snacks and drinks if you want to try and avoid it. Um, two things, that re three things that really struck me from, from Petri's presentation. What I love about these things, I've been doing this 20 years, um, you know, which is like pre-internet days, um, but there's still stuff to learn. And what reinforced with me today is firstly, there are no yachts. I mean, there might be somewhere, but there's certainly very few yachts in these stories. Secondly, it's about simplicity. As human beings, our cognitive bias is to complexity. We believe that we need to be complex in order to do something brilliant. In truth, most times, aside from bridges, bridges must be complicated. But trading, trading needs to be simple. 
simplicity in trading is what works. And trust me on this, and, and Petri verifies it. I mean, you know, it, it, that more indicators just add more confusion. And the third part, which is as important as simplicity, is process. And that process needs to be more than just a trading plan. It needs to be, as Petri says, it's, it's first thing he does in the morning is check the S&P 500, et cetera, et cetera. It needs to be that process, that repeatable process. But we'll leave it there. Uh, huge thanks to Petri. Great presentation. Really appreciate it.